Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of Making Metal with Max. Today is going to be episode number three in the GMAW series, so stay tuned and I hope you enjoy it. All right, guys, I'm back here. My name is Max Serrano. I'm an instructor at SAS Polytech. You can tell by my beard, my hair, things are getting a little shaggy during this COVID time. Hope you guys are all being safe and doing a great job out there. I know there's lots of great work going on, lots of good projects and garages. If you guys want to share any of the fun projects you're working on, tell me about where you're working or what you do or why you're watching these videos. You know, send me an email at askmax at cwbgroup.org. Uh, I'll put them up on my Insta. I'll share them. I've been sharing some of your guys' stories. I really love the feedback you guys are sending me, so that's great, and I hope we keep it up. All right, so the last episode got broken up into two sections because I went a little bit long, and I know I, I get to do that. In my mind, I think, you know, this is 20 minutes max, but then I just get going and it starts going crazy. Well, today's episode is a continuation on that. Where we ended up at the end of episode two is we're talking about the, the power structure, the voltage structure of the GMAW, and I had this little speedometer set up for you, right? With the 0, uh, 14, 24, 36. Okay. So here, or this could be 16, somewhere in there. So we have this volt, you know, speedometer where we can look at, you know, a short circuit. We have globular and we have spray. We talked a little bit about how that works in terms of arc length and in terms of uh, energy or heat. So the amperage would be the heat, right? That's the wire speed. And then you would have the voltage be the distance of the burn off being the arc length, okay? Now, those are in relation to each other. Too much arc length, not enough wire speed, it'll melt the tip. Too much wire speed, not enough arc length, the wire's gonna push into the into the puddle or into the material and that creates problems, okay? Now, one of the things we haven't really gotten into now is how the gas affects this. So in this situation, I'm using a solid wire, an ER70S-2, and I'm gonna say 035. Now, every wire and every diameter is going to have its own speedometer. Now, I just like having this in my mind because then it's an easy reference point for me to go to work with other things. If the wire gets thinner, then this tends to scale up. If the wire gets thicker, it tends to scale down. It depends on what you're doing, right? So for this, I want to look at this procedures and I can kind of figure out what type of gas I want to use based on my voltage, okay? Now, short circuit is considered kind of an all position because of its low temperature. So I can do short circuit wire in a flat, a horizontal, a vertical, and an overhead. Okay, now it's slow, but it works good, and it's clean. It's strong. Lots of times people will say, you know, stick is stronger than MIG or GMAW, and that's just simply not true. It's really based on the procedure and the type of wire and the parent metal. It's how you do it. You know, if you want to buy a weaker wire, then you buy a weaker wire. A 6010 has less tensile strength than a 7010, right? So it's just what you're buying. Now, as I go up, I get into the spray, which is considered really flat and horizontal only because there's so much wire, so much deposition rate that it takes time for all that energy to solidify, okay? To cool back down and become steel again from the liquid version of it. So if I try welding on a horizontal, I'm going to have to really watch that it doesn't drip. Now, there's this type of horizontal, which, you know, this works really well for the spray. You might get a little bit of the undercut issues that happens because gravity will always pull down on your weld no matter where you are. Gravity is a big, big factor in welding, especially at high deposition rates. Okay. Now, then there's also this type of horizontal. Now that's way trickier if you want to do in spray, almost not doable, all right? Now, vertical and overhead, forget about it. Now some guys will be like, okay, we know zap, 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 zap. That's cheating, it's not the real thing. That's just a series of tacks, that's not really welding, and it's not really a good weld, okay? Now, what does gas, what effect does gas have on this? Okay, so we went over a couple gases the other day, we went over your inerts, we'll have the inerts, and then we'll have the reactive or active gases here. So over here we have argon, we have helium, 
and over here we'll have CO2 and O2. Basically, the main structure of most gases that we'll use. Now, when I look at this, I'm going to have to think, what do I need? Well, let's start with the first gas that we always use, which is argon. Okay. Now, argon, we talked about it being like that bully gas, the big insulator. Okay, it comes in and it, and it pushes things out of the way and creates a safe zone for wells to happen. All right? Now, for that same reason, it's better at some components of welding than others. So, for example, if I'm in a really high heat, so in the spray zone, high voltage, high wire speed, okay, is argon good or bad? Well, at this level of heat and input, it's great, okay? I actually want as much argon as I can get in the, high, in the high heat area. Why? Well, the more heat, the more voltage, the more current, the more atmosphere draw is going to occur, the more deposition rate, the more issues can occur, the more amount of contamination can happen. So I need the most amount of bouncers to show up at that party. Okay? Here is a 3,000 person clubhouse, and I need a lot of bouncers. Okay, so usually they say for spray you need at least 80% argon for that to go well. To get that nice spray action, the cones coming out, it looks nice and clean, and you have a good gaseous shield around it created by the heavy argon. Okay, now that can be achieved at fairly low CFHs. You're somewhere maybe in the 20 to 30 tops, you know, tops, and that's going to create lots of coverage because you know, argon is great. It's heavy. Now I go to helium. Now, helium is like the little bouncer, a lot of little bouncers. Remember, we call them the ninjas. Now, they're expensive, and I can use them in spray, no problem. But I'm going to need a high concentration, and I'm going to have to really crank my volume, my CFHs, which means I'm going to have to be in the 50s, 60s, 70s for CFHs for helium, which means I'm going to draw a lot, I'm going to use a lot, and it's going to be a lot of money. Now, there are situations where I want a lot of helium because helium being smaller does affect the weld slightly differently, all right? It does allow for a deeper penetration on thicker joints because it keeps things more in line because you have a, a more dense cone of penetration of the gaseous shield. So, if I'm going to be welding, for example, and this comes up often in the third level question, so good thing to put in the bank, right? Helium is often used for thicker aluminum. Because you need to hit it with hard, direct heat in order to not let oxides build up and get the welding through. Okay, Aluminum is such a great heat sink. It's such a great thermal conductor and an electrical conductor that that's what makes it hard to weld. The heat that goes in gets dissipated so fast that it won't stay and make a puddle. Therefore, I need to hit it hard and fast. Okay, And helium is good for that. Argon's fine. But helium is good, especially if you want to go thick. Now, any type of thick, thick material, say four or five inch thick plate, I could have a, some version of a helium mix in there to help with deeper penetration. But at the end of the day, what I'm looking for here is stability. Okay, stability at high voltage and high amperages. So we know that this is good for the spray world. Now, the CO2O2 world, where would I want that? Well, we talked about its benefits. It's good for wetting, which means that the edges will blend easier. The, where it interacts with the unwelded plate versus the welded plate, that barrier is smoother and the transition is cleaner. So that's nice, right? It helps jack up the heat of the puddle at the point of the puddle, which is nice because then you're not putting the stress on your machine. You, the, the gas itself is contributing to the heat input, all right? Now, where is that great? Well, that's really good here in the short circuit. So I'm going to put CO2 here, and I'm going to put short circuit. Now, I'm at low temperature, low temp, okay, which means low voltage, low amperage. The wire is going to actually make contact, and that's kind of a cold, crappy process. So the wire is going to touch. It builds up heat through resistance, and then it blows off, creating a little puddle. Now, that doesn't sound great. It's basically like how I said, you don't want to weld and spray, zap, 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 zap. That's not great. Well, basically, in short circuit, I'm doing that on purpose. Pop, 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 thousands of times a second and creating a weld. Well, in order to have, in order to get past the issues of crappy penetration or poor fusion, 
because of the low heat input, I add a lot of CO2 or oxygen. Now, a lot is not a lot, but in ratio, it is quite a bit for this. So what happens is the gaseous shield itself will contribute to some heat input. And now those wet edges that we talked about being good are vital because the CO2 and the oxygen are going to allow this cold little droplet to fuse better on the edges to the plate. So in a short circuit world, we can run in some instances, depending on the wire, a lot of CO2 up to 25% or higher. We can run oxygen up to about 5%, which is quite a bit. Now I have seen 8% oxygen mixes. That gets a little bit tricky, but lots of times in the spray or short circuit world, you're going to be looking at something called the 75-25 mix. That's a very common mix for short circuit. So we're still mainly argon because we still need to bring the bullies to the party, right? But we're going to bring some firecracker oxygens and CO2s in there to get the heat up inside the house without burning the house down, okay? Now in the, short, in the spray world, in the spray world, we're going to be 80 plus with the remainder being CO2 or a small percent of oxygen, 1 to 2%, okay? So often in our shop right now, we're running a 90-10. 90% argon, 10% CO2. Because even at the spray level with the high heat where I could be running a lot of argon or all argon, I do like that wetting of the CO2. It does make for a nice clean edge. It does make for a prettier weld. And if you have the right wire that's got the right amount of deoxidizers to cover the oxygen input, you're golden. Okay? So, remember, as the heats go up, as the voltages go up, as the amperages go up, slash wire speed, your argon has to go up. And if you want to get the full spray, you want to be up over 80% of argon. Now, on the other end, if we're coming down in temperature, we're coming down in, in voltage and heats, in order to have a successful weld that blends well and actually fuses properly to the colder parent metal, at that low of a temperature, you're going to want to have an increase of CO2 or oxygen in order to account for the lack of fusion or the poor edges that are getting wet. So you to increase the better wetting, better penetration, better fusion. All right, make sense? Okay, next, we've incorporated the gas. We got our little parameters done, okay? We got that all figured out and we said, you know what? We got short circuit, we go up in temperature, we go to globular, we go up in temperature, we go to spray. Okay, and we thought, you know, great. And that's been the majority of GMAW welding for a long time. But things have changed, of course, because the machines have gotten better. Now you'll often see something added here, and we should all know how to use this right now, called pulse or pulse spray welding. Okay, now in most textbooks now, it's called the fourth. Okay, it's the fourth uh, type or, or, or process of GMAW welding. So we have short circuit where it's close. We have globular, it's getting a little bit further away. We have spray where it's really far away. But what happens? We talked about it a little bit earlier. I'm going to take my generic fillet in a horizontal position where I'm welding it. Here's my nozzle. Here's my contact tip, my wire coming through. I'm going to be welding this beautiful weld. I'm going to get a nice heat effect zone, good penetration. I'm happy with my spray weld. Everything's beautiful. I have it set super nice. But what happens as my plate gets hotter, as my welds get wider and bigger, I'm going to get the dreaded undercut, okay? Undercut's a problem, okay? Undercut is, a, is, a, is an issue that you cannot walk away from. You have to fix it. It's something that is, you know, it can be an NCR. It can be non-compliance. It could be a repair. It could be a fail, depending on the type of procedure you're welding to. So very often in spray welding, you'll have problems with undercut there, especially if you're looking at thicker plates and multi-pass welding. As the heats get up, the undercut gets worse and worse. And I wanna just run a little one in there, and I can maybe just fix that little spot there, and then it's okay, but then I'm gonna to have to go change all my parameters and come back, okay? Another negative effect, so one negative effect of spray is that I have undercut because of the high heat. Another issue of spray because of the high heat is that I can't weld thin materials. If I try to weld the thin material, I will just blow through, right? Because it's just too much heat. Okay, well, how do I fix that? Most industrial issue, most industrial 
places, welds, complexes, weldments, all run and spray. Why? Faster deposition rate, more work, fast cleaner, less cleaning, get out the door, make some money. I'm down with that. I like that. I like making money, right? But if I got to go back and fix undercut or cracking, or I can't weld thin plates and I got to grab a different machine, different wire, different settings, well, that slows down the process. So what do I want to do? Well, I'll explain to you what Pulse does. Okay? So here's our normal power curve. So if I set my machine, my my thing, I'm going to be at 26 volts. Okay? Here's, here's zero. So at 26 volts, I have a current that's running here. Now... I'm not including wire speed because that's going to be, say, at, you know, 450 wire speed, which is about 220 amps, somewhere in there, right? So this represents the whole unit of welding in just one simple graph, just to make it simple. So this is my output, and this is where I'm welding, and this is creating my weld with a little bit of undercut. Right there, that's that, okay? And I'm happy with the weld, I'm happy with the penetration, but I'm not happy with the undercut. So what does Pulse do? Well, what Pulse does is it actually drops your overall input, your voltage, your wire speed back a small amount in order to create a variation in the heat input. So we call this your peak current. That's the current you set on the machine. Now, on the older Pulse setups, it's basically Pulse is just on and off. You can have it on, you can have it off. On the newer machines, I can really get in there and adjust everything. And what am I adjusting? Well, what you're going to be adjusting is something called the background current. Okay, so you got your foreground, foreground or your peak current, and then you have your background current, which is either set by the machine on a, on a ratio or set by you, depending on the machine. And this, say I'm at 26 volts here, this might be at 21. I'm just picking a number. So what's happening now is that my temperature in the machine is going to be pulsing back and forth between those two variables. Now, something that people say wrong all the time is that pulse is turning off and on. That is not happening. It would not be beneficial if I have this and I have 26 volts here. It would not be beneficial for the machine to go on and off from 26 volts to zero. That would be a, a disaster. Okay, that's nobody wants that. What I want is to just drop back a little bit. And basically what it's dropping back to is kind of like the edge of globular if you want to really get specific. Because what's happening is that globular is really good because of lower temperature at not having undercut. So what's happening now is that I will be able to weld the same uh, horizontal fillet without any undercut now. Because every time it drops down, it's giving it a chance to cool a slight little bit. Just a teeny bit. Enough so that it won't drop down from gravity. That's a nice feature. And lots of the new machines out there, actually on the switch, will have a toggle. So on, say, switch A on my gun, I will be able to, you know, uh, normal spray, normal spray, normal spray, 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 pulse. Flip it to B for my last speed across the top so that it just slides in with no undercut and nice and clean. Another benefit of pulse is also that there's much less smoke much less uh, like uh, issues with spatter. It's generally a much cleaner weld. Okay, because we're, we're staying away from it overheating and being too pe peaky, okay? Now that's the first benefit of Pulse. Another benefit of Pulse, as it's gotten better and better, is that now I can weld thinner materials. Now I'm not gonna get too crazy here, but let's say on that 26 volts, 450 wire speed on 035, I can maybe weld as thin as quarter inch ish, and then I might blow through or get too hot. I might create problems or lots of distortion. Well, in pulse, my distortion will get reduced because I have the cooling times, and I will be able to weld on thinner metals because I won't be blowing through as much. Okay, so I can be a little bit more cautious with it. Now, here's a couple negatives about pulse that people don't tell you about. First of all, and this is something that I think everyone should know. If I have my normal spray welding, lots of people like to weld with a slight whip or back step. So as you weld in spray, you do kind of this motion. And that creates those pretty little lines on your weld. Okay? So when you're done your weld, it looks all pretty and has those little ridges in it. You put those ridges in by that little bit of motion that you create. Now, I generally... 
and personally, professionally, don't like that. I can do it sometimes, but I only do it if I'm really looking for a visual output. Really, and I, in really, in my professional life, I'm not so concerned with visual as I am about quality. And I want quality welds, which means I like a nice, steady, no screwing around type of weld. But if you want to make it pretty, go ahead and make it pretty. But realize that you may be compromising some root penetration because any motion like that is transferring your heat current, your line of current, every step you're screwing with it. So be careful. Now in pulse, if I do this in pulse, no way. Pulse needs contact in order for the machine to understand what's happening. And if I try doing this or this motion when I'm in pulse, the machine will not be able to read my voltage properly. And what happens is that I'll snuff out. The machine will ramp up and ramp down or my, my peak and background currents will go off. And what happens is that the wire will start stubbing out or you'll see the wire going like that. And that's the machine trying to compensate. Be steady. Let the machine do its thing. Right? Let the, the, let the technology weld. So those are the pluses and minuses of pulse. We're flying through this. What does gas do to a GMAW weld? We learned that. What does pulse do to a GMAW, GMAW weld? It only helps in spray. So if people are like, well, did you do that in pulse short circuit? Get out of town. You don't know what you're talking about. Pulse is a spray thing. Okay? Because we need the high peak foreground current in order to create a background current or else it's not happening. Now, what's the last thing I want to talk about in this episode? I don't want to talk about inductance. Now that's a tricky one for a lot of people. So first of all, if you have never heard of inductance or when we get to small arc force, you know, wake up, come on. This is something that everyone should be playing with. There's knobs on your welder that you should know what they do. And they didn't get invented for nothing. They got invented because they serve a purpose. And those purposes will help you in your job and in your craft, okay? So what is inductance? What is that dial? Usually it's a little dial on the front that'll say zero to 10, or it'll be a plus minus, okay? Now we're gonna go into variations of this when we get to modified waveforms next episode, because this is a door that opens that gets huge. But at the base level on just your normal GMAW setup, you're gonna have a little dial that says inductance. And you're like, what the heck is that? Now, we talked about how spray is, pulse will only work in spray. Well, inductance, is only good for short circuit, okay? This is a short circuit feature. Just like pulse is a spray feature, okay? So what's happening inside the wire? And there's lots of graphics out there, lots of infographics that'll show you, right? Wire comes down, touches. Then the wire comes down, burns off, creates a droplet, and then it, you know, this happens back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, zip, 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 that's, Burr, 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 right? That's the short circuit. Okay? That's very simple. Now, if I were to graph this out on a chart, wire's coming down. There's no power happening. So as soon as the wire touches, resistance goes up. This sucker starts to get red hot, red hot, red hot, and poof! A release of energy as the droplet melts. It transfers the energy into the ball. The wire burns off, which then terminates the resistance line. So this is the energy being spent during one touch of one droplet during short circuit. It builds up the resistance to a higher than melting point because the surface tension of any product will hold on. Okay, and surface tension is a very important thing, especially in short circuit or modified waveforms. We're going to get really deep into surface tensions in the next episode. But the surface tension, which would normally be here, this is your normal burn-off. Your surface tension holds up, which means you have to go up and above, okay? So, poof, I burn off that energy, and then I have a gap. It's not touching. Oh, the wire touches again, and it repeats the process. Each one of these is a drop, okay? Now, this is very important to remember. I have my machine set to 14 volts and 145 wire speed at 035, okay? Now, this is gonna give me an output of X energy. You can do the math, you can do some ohms, V, uh, you know, it'd be uh, VIR, the uh, ohms triangle, right? VIR, so if I'm looking for resistance here, I would be volts over amperage, I get a number, I put that over the time and the diameter of the wire, I do some math and I get up an X. 
So this whole droplet is an output of X energy or joules. Okay? Now, there's some issues with this X. This is spattered. When this peak blows off, it is a little bit higher than it needs to be, and I get spattered. It creates an inconsistency in my power curve. You can see it's got a little spike. That little spike is presented to you in terms of little splatters, okay? Now, what inductance does is that it takes this X and turns it into a smoother curve. It's taken that peak out, flattened it out, and allowed it to be spread over longer. Okay? Now, if I go to 10, it'll elongate it as much as it can. If I go to 0, it doesn't change anything. Now, this is also very important to know. Screwing with inductance, having your knob here from 0 to 10 going up, does not change X. Okay? Your voltage didn't go up or down. Your average didn't go up or down. All you've done is adjust the curve of power within that moment of burn off, which gives you either better penetration, better edges, or, and less spatter based on how far you go with inductance. Okay? Another way, good way to think about this before I wrap up. I only have about five minutes here. If I took a string and I laid out a string along this path and I stopped to where the weld stopped, I would have a string this long, okay? Inductance never changes the length of that string. It merely changes how you place it on the board. So now my hot time is longer. My ramp ups have been smoother, but I took, I made this longer here and smoothed this out here by taking this extra string there and filling it in those spots. And my string or my power usage is the same. Okay? So don't be like, oh, my inductance is making the weld hotter. Or my inductance is making the weld colder. No. What you're doing is you're using the heat differently. How are you going to place it? Where are you going to put it? And what are you going to do with it? All right. Play with that inductance. Hope you guys like today's episode on GMAW. Today is episode three. Uh, to, uh, I'm going to record episode four this week. Um, we're going to be getting into the modified waveforms, which will probably be about two episodes because there's a lot of crazy stuff happening. Like, I mean, this happens in a fraction of a second, and inverters are able to make some of these adjustments within fractions of a second. But as we've learned in previous episodes, once we get to modified waveforms, we're talking about one one hundredth of a thousandth of a second or one ten thousandth of a second. And we can now really start playing with these power curves and creating different things. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or you want to send me anything or you want me to just show me, show me what you're doing. It's cool. You know, send it to askmax at cwbgroup.org. Stay tuned for more episodes. Hopefully by the next one, I get a shave and a haircut because, uh, you know, I got uh, I got to get one at some point here and uh, I'm getting pretty scruffy. And uh, I hope to see you again. Thanks a lot, guys.